Hello again, and welcome to the Sports Report, the archived editions. I'm Dave Rush in St. David's, just north of the Great Niagara Falls, along with John Poulter in Toronto. John, welcome to the show today. Thank you very much, Dave. As always, it's fun to chat with you on the archives. It sure is. Today we're going into hockey and Roger Nielsen. So, John, let's talk about Roger Nielsen. He has a rich history uh, here with you and in uh, the realms of hockey in Toronto. Yeah, he certainly does, Dave. Uh, I, I had the pleasure and the opportunity to actually know Roger Nielsen, so uh, I can speak firsthand when I talk about uh, Roger Nielsen. Uh, he was famous as an NHL coach. Uh, just looking very quickly at some of his stats, um, in all or part of 17 seasons in the NHL, he coached exactly 1,000 games. And there's a story behind that that we'll get to later. And that 1,000 games uh, produced a record of 460 wins, 378 losses, 159 ties, three overtime losses for a round total of 1,082 points. So slightly over 500, if you want to slice it that way. Uh, he also coached 106 playoff games in the NHL uh, with a 51-55 and 55 record there. Most of his achievements uh, and recognition are off the ice, and a lot of that we will get to later. But uh, some of the things that uh, he uh, did achieve while he was alive or, or knew about while he was alive was uh, that he was awarded a Doctor of Laws by McMaster University, which is in Hamilton, Ontario, in 2001. He was elected to the Hockey Hall of Fame as a builder in 2002. And for those that don't know what a builder is, I'm builder, one of them. You, I thought you might be. <laughs> uh, a builder is not a guy who builds hockey arenas. Uh, I think everybody knows that. A builder of hockey is somebody who contributes to hockey in a way other than actually playing on the ice. So it could be a coach, a general manager, a team owner. Uh, perhaps in some cases a scout. Uh, it brought, does not include broadcasters and newspaper reporters. They have their own little wing. They're not actually honored members of the hall. They are members of a portion of the hall. So uh, Roger was uh, elected as a builder in 2002. He was also granted the Order of Canada, which is a, a commendation by the Canadian government in 2002. And he was responsible for several innovations in the game of hockey, which we'll also talk about a little later in the program, some of which actually were initiating, uh, resulted in initiating rule changes by the leagues in which he was coaching at the present time. So, uh, you know, here's a guy that has a pretty a good history in terms of his uh, coaching record. Uh, and, you know, what else can I say other than the fact that uh, here's a man that made his mark on the NHL. Thousand games. I believe there are only nine coaches that have coached a thousand games in the NHL. So that in itself is an absolute achievement. Uh, he coached seven or eight teams. So his services were always uh, in demand and, uh, as I say, a very well respected man in the hockey community. OK, John. Well, um, so tell us how it started with Roger Nielsen. Well, to you know, go right back to the beginning, uh, he was born in uh, the former town of Weston, Ontario, W-E-S-T-O-N, not E-R-N. Uh, Weston is now part of the city of, of Toronto, and he was born in 1934. He attended high school in what we now know as Midtown Toronto, uh, where he played both bas uh, baseball and hockey, then went on to McMaster University, uh, as I mentioned, in Hamilton, Ontario, where he graduated with a degree in physical education. He then became a high school teacher and was teaching uh, phys ed uh, in Peterborough, Ontario, uh, at a high school called Crestwood High School on Sherbrooke Street, uh, when a scouting job came up with the Peterborough Peets of what was then the OHA and is now the OHL. And for those who aren't familiar with the role of uh, major junior hockey, uh, in, the ter in the hockey uh, world, it's akin to... Uh, uh, college football and college basketball is in those two sports. It's a major stepping stone for aspiring professional hockey players. And at that time, the Peets uh, were the top Eastern Canada junior farm team of the uh, famous Montreal Canadiens. And around Christmas time of 1966, uh, a gentleman by the name of Roger Bedard, who was uh, the, the coach of the Peterborough Peets, they didn't call them head coach in those days because there was only one coach, 
He was suspended by the league uh, for six games uh, as a result of getting into an altercation with an opposing coach after a game. So because it was Christmas time and the schools were out, uh, Roger Nielsen was, uh, quote, available. And the Peets uh, put him in charge for six games while Bedard was out. During the uh, six games, the Peets only lost once. So uh, Nielsen made his mark pretty early uh, as, as an interim coach. Later that season, uh, Bedard retired and uh, Nielsen finished the season uh, again on an interim basis. And then for the start of the 67-68 season, he took over the team on a full-time basis. And when he took over the team on a full-time basis, he was there for nine complete seasons. During those nine seasons, posted 276 wins and 95 ties. And while he was in Peterborough, this was the first sort of start of his innovations while he was in Peterborough, his teaching background and his belief in education uh, triggered his decision to enforce a rule on the Peets that if you didn't go to school, you didn't play hockey. And school could be high school, uh, because we're talking 16, 17, 18-year-olds, or it could be talking college or university, because you could play junior hockey till you were 21 years old. So Roger uh, sort of implemented very early the uh, desire for students and hockey players to get educated. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, over the years, that is that has become such a landmark decision that now all major junior hockey teams in Canada have the same rules. So, you know, there was his first major step in being an innovator. And, you know, after the time with the Peets, uh, in 1976-77, he became the head coach, uh, the coach of the Dallas Blackhawks of the Central Hockey League. And at that time, the Central Hockey League was uh, some, a type of development league for the NHL where the, each team's roster had to have a certain percentage of the players under the age of 23. And although it carried the Blackhawks name, uh, Dallas was a team that was jointly owned by the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Chicago Blackhawks. <clears throat> that one year in Dallas led to a head coaching job uh, in Toronto, which was the start of a very long journey through the NHL, uh, various positions, mostly as head coach, sometimes as assistant coach. He was in Toronto for two years, then he moved on to Buffalo, then he moved on to Vancouver an interim stint in L.A. with the Kings before he moved on to the New York Rangers, the Florida Panthers, and the Philadelphia Flyers, making his mark in each place, and in most cases leading the team to the playoffs and doing a very good job. Unfortunately, uh, the, the end started uh, just before the 2000 playoffs while he was in Philadelphia. He was diagnosed with, uh, initially with bone cancer and uh, went on medical leave. The bone cancer eventually spread and uh, became skin cancer in 2001. And when he was uh, taken uh, away from the Flyers bench and put a, and took medical leave, he was replaced by a gentleman by the name of Craig Ramsey. And uh, ironically, uh, Ramsey was an assistant coach with the Flyers at the time, but he'd also been a player for Nielsen in both Peterborough as a junior and in Buffalo. And Craig Ramsey is also an individual I've had the opportunity to, met, to meet. Uh, the Flyers didn't do badly. Uh, they didn't win the Stanley Cup. Uh, but given Nielsen's health, the Flyers decided that perhaps going forward, uh, Ramsey was a better choice. Uh, so they decided to part ways with Nielsen. And uh, Ramsey continued as the head coach. After leaving the Flyers, uh, he Nielsen took a job uh, as an assistant coach with the Ottawa Senators. And uh, in what I believe to be a very classy move, uh, then-Senators head coach Jacques Martin invited Neil Nielsen to step up and be the head coach for the final two games of the 2001-2002 season in order to reach 1,000 games coached. And I well, thought that was... How he, that's, that's how, how we got happens. That's how we got to exactly 1,000. And uh, I was wondering uh, how he would actually hit the 1,000 number. Yeah. out to me. Yeah, he was at 998, and uh, Jacques Martin, the, the Senators uh, were completely out of it at that point, uh, so the two games were sort of meaningless in the standings. Uh, I, I thought it was a great move by Jacques Martin, and Martin is, is still around the game. I believe he's in Pittsburgh as an assistant coach. Not widely known, uh, other than his uh, time as head coach for a while in Florida, head coach for a while in Ottawa, but a uh, very classy move by uh, Martin to, uh, to allow Roger Nielsen to do that. Roger Nielsen uh, also had a couple of jobs in hockey that were outside uh, coaching. Uh, he spent some time as a video coach for the Edmonton Oilers. 
And he spent two seasons as a color commentator on TSN, which is the Canadian equivalent of uh, ESPN. Uh, and they a hockey uh, contract. So here's a man that had a uh, pretty widespread variety of jobs in the NHL and uh, in, in, in hockey in general. So uh, I guess to say that hockey was his life uh, might be a, a bit of an understatement. I spoke earlier that he was responsible for a number of innovations in the game. And uh, that list is, is fairly lengthy. I'll try and get through it very quickly. Uh, he introduced the use of videotape into the NHL coaching area. That earned him the moniker Captain Video. He was the first to use uh, microphones and headsets to communicate with his assistant coaches. When the faceoff was in the other team's end, he, with two or three seconds left to play in a period, he would often uh, take his goaltender out thinking that even if his team lost the draw, uh, the other team would not be able to get down the ice in two or three seconds and score a goal. He knew the rule book inside out. Uh, that allowed him to find loopholes that helped his teams. Uh, early in his Pete's career, in the last minute of, of a game, if his down, team was down two players as a result of penalties resulting in the op opposition having a five-on-three advantage, he would often throw an extra player on the ice to immediately stop play, have the referees uh, call a penalty, but of course that penalty couldn't be served because a team can no longer be can be no more than two men short. That allowed his team to rest, regroup, refocus, and perhaps win the faceoff. Very innovative. But guess what? Shortly after that, the league put in a rule and said, "Guys, you can't do that anymore." So he'd beaten the rule book. Uh, he would also uh, instruct his goaltenders when they left their crease uh, for the last minute of playing a game to leave their stick across the ice, thinking that the uh, obvious intent of the other team would just be to try and ice the puck down uh, the rink, hopefully hit the net. Chances are the puck would be on the ice as opposed to in the air. The stick would stop it. Guess what? The next season, the league changed that rule. You had to, the goalie had to take his stick with him when he left the, the ice. Wouldn't that make sense, though? I mean, oh, I'm yeah. surprised that didn't occur earlier. Somebody well, thought of that. Of course. Just put the well, stick know, in front of the goal if, 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 know, it's, I, if it's legal. Well, I got to tell you, Roger was very innovative in a lot of ways. And, and, on, and another way, and this was very, very uh, unique, he had a dog that he was very fond of. The uh, dog's name was Jake. And uh, he would, when he was teaching his defensemen and his hockey players about uh, getting the puck from behind the net, he would put his dog behind the net and he would have a player out front and he would kind of move one way or move the other way and the dog would chase the puck. So he tried to instill upon his players that, you know, this is just human nature to move in the direction that you see people moving. And he took his dog to the rink and taught his players what they should have known as individuals. I mean, the, the guy was just innovative. Uh, another thing that he did was uh, he was the first guy, in fact, the only guy, that when there was a penalty shot against his team to remove his goaltender and put a defenseman in there. His thinking, thinking was that the defenseman was more agile, was more mobile, could more easily get to the shooter than a goaltender could in full equipment. Uh, first guy that he did that with was a guy by the name of Ron Stackhouse. And I think Stackhouse was about 6'3", 210. At that time, he, I was big for a hockey player. He put him in the net. And uh, I, I know it was successful a couple of times. I know it was successful at least once. I was actually at a game against the Toronto Marlboros when he did that. So, uh, you know, here, again, here's a guy that was innovative, to say the least. Uh, while he was in Vancouver, he felt that the referee was being very one-sided against the Canucks uh, in calling penalties in the playoff game. So he took a white towel, put it at the top of a hockey stick, held the hockey stick high in the air as if he was surrendering. Several other players on the bench did the same thing. That sort of became a tradition shortly after that. And uh, fans came to the next game and the games thereafter waving white towels. And that's uh, was sort of the start of what we see today in sports playoff games where fans are waving white towels. And uh, ironically, at Rogers Arena in Vancouver, there's a statue of Roger Nielsen in the lobby, and uh, he's standing there uh, waving a towel. So, you know, his legacy lives on in, in that respect. But if we're going to talk about legacies, uh, the legacy of Roger Nielsen all started, unfortunately, when he passed away from cancer in 2003. And it was June of 2003, a few days after his 69th birthday. Uh, 
Um, his funeral was attended by so many people, both hockey related and non hockey related, that uh, only the hockey people were allowed in the church, and it was by invite only. Everybody else was in a large tent on the church grounds. That's that's how much Roger Nielsen was respected in the city of Peterborough. In 2003, the city of Peterborough renamed the southern portion of George Street, and George Street is the main business street in Peterborough. The street was renamed Roger Nielsen Way, and Roger Nielsen Way is adjacent to the Memorial Center, which is the home rink of the Peets, uh, again, still playing in the OHL. The Ottawa Senators have named their coach's office at Scotiabank Place their home arena, the Roger Nielsen Room. The City of Ottawa renamed their minor Pee Wee AAA hockey division after Nielsen in 2005. Also in 2005, the Ontario Hockey League created an award for the top academic player, either at college or university, and named it the Roger Nielsen Award. Shortly after his death, the Senators uh, announced plans to build a place called Rogers House, uh, which was later, re later renamed Roger Nielsen House, a pediatric palliative care facility located on the grounds of a big children's hospital in Ottawa. The building was opened in 2006, I believe, by Dalton McGinty, who at that time was the Premier of Ontario. September of 2004, a new elementary school opened in Peterborough. It was named Roger Nielsen Public School in memory of his dedication to education. He was popular, he was a well-respected member in all of the communities in which he worked, and he maintained his residence in Peterborough right from the time that he went to coach there in 1967 until his passing in 2003. Well, that's very nice when he can uh, actually, you know, start somewhere, wind up somewhere, and become a legend in a town like Peterborough. Peterborough. Oh, yeah, very much so, and Peterborough is very much a hockey town, and, uh, you know, I look back on, on the time that I knew Roger Nielsen. Um, I went to work in Peterborough in, in 1980. And as you, you know, and perhaps other people know, I worked for a major financial institution. At that time, uh, Nielsen was the head coach with the Buffalo Sabres, uh, having uh, spent many years in Peterborough and Toronto, then in Buffalo. Shortly after I arrived, uh, sitting in my office one day, a staff member came in and uh, said, John, there's, there's a client outside that would like to come in and say hello. So, uh, you know, I was new in town uh, in the process of meeting all of my clients. Uh, gentleman came in. As soon as he walked through the door, uh, I recognized him immediately. He didn't need to tell me who he was. Uh, st stuck out his hand, extended his hand, like mine, and his exact words were, Hello, John. My name is Roger Nielsen. Welcome to Peterborough. And, you know, not for one second had he presumed that I would know who he was, that he was famous in town, that he was a well-known hockey coach. He was just a regular guy coming in to say hello. And, you know, he was an educator. He was a very good hockey coach. Most of all, he was a very good human being. My mind, Roger Nielsen was a class act. No other way to describe him. John Poulter in Toronto on Roger Nielsen. This is the Sports Archives.